welcome to another episode of Film Speak, where we are working to bring the love of film to the masses. I'm Lana. And I'm Bill. We have a great show planned for you today, so no change in the channel. That's right. Local actor Jocelyn Tannis and writer Brian Dobbins will be here to discuss filmmaking and then break down the classic film, Bringing Up Baby. I love that movie. Hey, Lana, did you get a chance to uh, check out the MTV Movie Awards? No, I didn't. How was it? Not bad. A lot better now that they stopped making those darn Twilight movies. Got me to thinking, though. Ooh, that sounds so dangerous. They have different awards than most shows do. Oh, like Best Fight and Best Kick. Exactly. I thought, what awards would we get? Like Best Character Actor or Best Use of Foreshadowing? Or maybe Best Camera Movement. You know I love that. Great idea. Maybe we should ask our guests and see what they think. Join us at the table where we will join Jocelyn and Brian and talk shop and break down bringing up baby. Excellent. Ensign, take this to engineering. Can I get a yes, Captain? This is the military, you know. Do you speak? Well, then say something. You realize I could have you killed. 300 people on this ship and I can only get six to talk to me. You know, I made it with a green alien once. Does that impress you? No. Carry on. Hey. Sorry I'm late. That's okay. What's good here? Listen, we need to talk. What is it? I know you cheated on me. Our specials today are the crab stuffed filet mince seared rat. We're gonna need lamb. a minute. <sighs> Alright, you guys know the plan. Tommy, you at the jewelry store at 1230. Take out the security guards. Janice? I go in through the skylight, take the manager into the vault, get the key off him. Good. Now I need you guys to cut the phone lines and turn off the alarms. I'll handle crowd control. Alright, this is where you come in. You need to have your van right here at the entrance at exactly 1241. You, I want you to gas up that car, make sure you got your glasses on, you got a map, all right? As long as everything absolutely goes to plan, nothing could go wrong. Everybody's good? The one was tailed, right? You got it. All right, let's see what we got here. Nice. to point out bad cliches in movies. Ever notice that every single movie that shows you a plan about how they're going to do something and it never, ever, ever works out right? Whenever a movie shows the audience what the team is about to do, rob a bank, steal the plans, or do anything, it's like a roadmap of predictability to see how it's not going to work out. How boring would a movie be if everything worked out exactly like the plan? All right, you guys know the plan, Tommy? You hit the jewelry store at 12.30, knock out the security guards, make sure they're all wrapped up, bring enough rope. Janice? I go in through the skylight, take the manager into the vault, get the key off them. Good. Now I need you guys to cut the phone lines and turn off the alarms. I'll handle crowd control. All we need you to do is distract all the customers with your great mime act. You're gonna be running a distraction on all the people over here. I'll need you in your clown outfit and a big, big buzzer, okay? As long as everything absolutely goes to plan, nothing could go wrong. Everybody's good? The one was tailed, right? You got it. All right. Let's see what we got here. Nice. Sure, the movie would be a whole lot shorter, but it would be the most unpredictable movie ever if the plan went off exactly like they said. You want to know what bothers me? Bad cliches in movies. You know, the completely unrealistic and annoying parts where we, the audience, think that doesn't work like that. Like this. Don't you hate it when extras in a movie or TV show aren't allowed to talk? Like on Star Trek when the captain talks to a crew member. Ensign, take this to engineering. Can I get a yes, captain? This is the military, you know. Do you speak? Well then, say something. You realize I could have you killed. 
300 people on this ship, and I can only get six to talk to me. Carry on. The reason movies and TV shows do this is because of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild rules. If someone opens their mouth and says a single word, their pay goes from $148 a day to over a thousand bucks a day. And you'd have to pay residuals. So movies do unrealistic things to save a few bucks. You know, I made it with a green alien once, right? Does that impress you? For many people starting out making movies, just photographing the scene they wrote is enough, shooting it from one angle, like this. Here we have a simple scene where a man and a woman are meeting at a restaurant. Hey, sorry I'm late. Okay. So, what's good here? Listen, we need to talk. You can even add coverage from a few angles to make it more visually interesting, like this. We need to talk. Well, what is it? I know you cheated. Using the camera to help tell the story means that just as the actors have to change their performance to match the dialogue, the camera needs to change as well. And at the moment she tells him she knows he cheated on her, the cameras have to reflect the change in the relationship. We can change the height of the camera so that we are looking down at him and up at her. This alone changes the tone of the scene. We can also change the angle so there's an awkward negative space, even showing the door in the frame, subconsciously showing that he wants to leave. You can also add camera movement to make the whole scene move along to the emotions of the scene. Hey, sorry I'm late. That's okay. What's good here? Listen, we need to talk. What is it? I know you cheated on me. Our specials today are the crab stuffed filet mince seared. Rat We're gonna need lamb. a minute. <sighs> Notice the dolly shot. The camera movement in insinuates the man's guilt. Directing isn't just yelling action and cut. You have to use the camera to help tell the story. When you make your shot list, think about how to make the camera a part of the scene. Things don't happen in real time in movies. Duh, we all know that, but how does it happen? People just accept that the edits are happening and that we don't need all that stuff in between to understand what's going on. Let's compress the edit, removing all the little pieces in between, getting to only what we really need to see. When the hero is putting on their gear, in real time, it takes a lot longer. In movies, we want to just get to the good parts. We want to see what's most important to the story, and it's okay to cut out all the little stuff in between. Coverage is shooting a scene from a variety of angles. Having more than one camera angle with varying distances, that allows editing. Each angle is called a shot, and each shot needs a new setup. Because when making a movie, lighting is changed for each shot to make it not only consistent, but get the best out of lighting and exposure. 
One thing that helps in editing when you get your coverage is to shoot cutaways. This is anything you shoot in the scene that doesn't need to directly synchronize sound, like a close-up of an object or a person who isn't talking. Continuity in editing is essential. One of the most effective techniques for invisible editing is cutting on motion, like this. Here we have two separate shots, a wide shot and a close-up of the same motion. The key is finding frames of motion that match, then cutting at that point. Making a cut from the wide shot to the close-up while the movement is in the same place and we have a seamless edit. The viewer's eyes are naturally drawn to movement. Continuity of actor's posture, gestures, and movements are crucial to making this work. Whether it's a hand gesture, the way their head turns, anything in the frame that's moving tends to draw the viewer's eye to that part of the frame. Viewers are seeing the movement and aren't noticing the change in shot. And because we have two different shots, the wide shot is showing us more of the environment, and a close-up lets us know how the actor is feeling. It's much more effective storytelling. Organization and production is incredibly important. Because filmmaking is a collaborative art, everybody has to communicate with each other. There are three phases to making any movie. Pre-production, which is the writing and preparation for the shoot, creating shot lists and storyboards. Production, which is the shoot. And post-production, where it all comes together in editing and everything involved in that. From the script, you can create the shot list. This is just writing down on paper what angles you want to get. You can do storyboards too. For each scene, you'll want to write out the shot name, then what type of shot you want to get. When you get to production, you can use that shot list and or your storyboards, and those will be used on the slate marker. After the shoot, when it comes to editing, the assistant editor will name the computer files the same as the what was on the slate. When you record sound separate from picture, it's important to say the slate information out loud Ford Baker, take three, marker. So that you can name the files consistently and synchronize everything more marker. easily. So if the editor or producer or director want to correlate anything from their script to match the shoot in editing, then everything can be found easily. Creating storyboards becomes more important as your productions get larger and larger. Storyboards are a way of showing your intentions more clearly to the entire crew. These are a way of clearly communicating to cast, the camera and lighting departments, and even hair and makeup or wardrobe and props as to what is needed in each shot. How much is seen inside a frame can even determine how much time is needed for scheduling. Even rough thumbnail storyboards with stick figures can help get an idea across to people. Or you can do more detailed storyboards with even more information in the frame. Going one step further, you can animate the storyboards in the computer to create animatics that show camera movement and timing for the scene so you can demonstrate pacing. Storyboards are sometimes drawn outside the frame so you can allow more movement of the camera or even allow more options when shooting. Sometimes storyboards are just rough ideas and sometimes they can be exactly what winds up on screen. Welcome back to Film Speak. Uh, me and Lana are sitting here with uh, Jocelyn and Brian uh, about to discuss uh, filmmaking and the projects that they have going on right now. Um, so tell me, um, Brian, what are you currently working on? Oh, well, I'm working on novels, actually. Uh, writing is writing, I suppose, but uh, I've done a lot of different kinds of writing. In the last few years, it's been mostly novels. 
I've got a uh, series with one publisher that is a witchcraft detective series. The wife is a witch, the husband's a private detective. And then another series that is a western, so just completely different genres. They call it literary suicide. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, they're both in the works, they're both uh, out there. And I just actually just finished the sequel to the western one last night. The first draft, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How many drafts do you usually write? Well, it's hard to say. Um, I, I, I figure a draft is a draft when I've got the last words typed. And then I go back and work it to death until someone makes me stop. And uh, then it goes to readers, and eventually we'll get to an editor who will send it back to me for changes. And again, someone will have to make me stop, or I'll just, I'll just keep working on it forever. I, I find uh, it takes a long time for me to be satisfied when writing something. Because mm -hmm. I can write it once, and sometimes I'm like, well, that's okay, I can do that. But if I really want it, I, one of my screenplays, I've rewritten it 11 times. <laughs> you know, it's just that, that fine, every time you're making a sharper, sharper point with it. I've taken it to a new level entirely. Uh, the first book, Jasmine's Tale, was actually published years ago. Uh, it was called Jasmine's Husband Sam. I was uh, doing comic books for Al Tudor at West Street Books, and I had a dream that I thought would make a good comic book series. So I started developing it. It kept getting bigger. He told me to just write the book, and Al Tudor is the one who published me, took a, f a chance on me, published that first one. But it wasn't the book I wanted it to be. So several years later, I revised it, um, added 15,000 words, and it became Jasmine's Tale, which is published by uh, Postmortem Press. Wow. So, yeah, I actually, that's kind of like a, someone, go, a painter going to a museum and taking his painting off the wall and saying, I'm doing this over. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> now, what is your process like? Do you have a daily process when you try to write so many words a week or a day, or? I drink. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Hemingway said, anyway. uh, Hemingway said, write drunk, edit sober. Um, <laughs> I find this good advice to adhere to. Uh, works what do you for drink? me. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Right, right. <laughs> Generally, right it's either uh, whiskey or wine. Okay. For some reason, beer doesn't go with writing for me. I, I think that's true with a lot of writers. It really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I think a lot of uh, writers are bourbon or scotch drinkers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah both. <laughs> <laughs> bourbon. <laughs> I'm, I'm easy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have whatever's on hand. But you do get really creative, you know. You're just sitting there and you're typing stuff and it starts flowing. And, and then the next day you look at it with a clear eye, you know, editing. And, and you go, what is that? <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say uh, you write drunk because you're just messing up. You know, but loosen up a little bit. Yeah. Get in there. Get in there with that little bottle, of, that little glass of bourbon and write something. Freeze the mind, yes, a little bit of yes, the mental yes. inhibitions. <laughs> um, other than that, you know, a lot of writers feel like a thousand words a day is what they want to hit. Okay. Um, anywhere around there is good enough for me. 800, 1200. Well, you know, sometimes I find the perspective of even if I'm not writing, I'm writing. You sure. Know, I'm, I'm working around the house, I'm cleaning, I'm right, walking right. the dog, but in my head, I'm breaking down characters, I'm thinking action, what's going to be happening Constantly. Next. Yeah, so whether, whether I'm sitting there in front of the keyboard or not, That's right. doing 200 words in a day or 2,000, um, I'm still, it's still the same. The writer's almost never not working. Yeah. I'm always doing what, just what you said, I'm always working something in my mind or stealing something that I hear in a conversation. Besides making stuff up, I do steal things. Oh, absolutely. Um, so. Do you find yourself being more and more inspired by people you deal with on a daily basis for the characters in your books? Uh, most of my characters are more or less combinations of different people I've known. Okay. Um, or completely just out of my head. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the one book is, uh, as I said, uh, witches and private detectives. I had absolutely no interest in witchcraft when I started that book, it was just a dream. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the prologue to that is exactly that first dream. Nice. I didn't change a thing. Um, and then, of course, because it was on my mind, I started having a series of dreams after that. And, uh, it, you know, if they're falling into your lap like that, you better write them. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Now, um, Jocelyn, uh, 
speaking of characters and stuff, I mean, a, as, a, as an actor, how do you approach doing characters? Well, there's a whole bunch of different, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, the method, mm -hmm. or you know, there's all, all kinds of different techniques, and I think it's actually just a little different for everybody. Um, is this a character that I can personally relate to? It's a lot easier that way. Or is this a character that's like somebody I know that I can emulate? Or um, is this a character that I cannot relate to at all? And then it's a little more difficult. Then it's really, you have to get so much more out of your head. Um, it's kind of interesting. You, say, you said that, uh, you know, people that you know. Um, I had read that Peter Sellers, who I, I consider an incredible actor, oh, especially a comedic actor, um, every character he did, he said that they were people from his family and from his youth, and that he didn't really act, he imitated. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's what he, you know, that's where the base of his characters came from, was just imitating family members. Absolutely. Whenever possible, I try to find a real-life example of something like that. You know, um, if I'm playing a cop, I know a few cops, mm -hmm. and I try to think, what are, what are some of their mannerisms? Um, little things that they do, you know, you got the guy that's always always got the coffee mug and he's always taking a sip or motioning with the coffee mug and just little things to try and bring depth to the character but it's got to be something that I know yeah mm -hmm. do you have any projects that you are currently working on um, yeah actually a few uh, the big one is a werewolf movie uh, indie film called autumn moon um, it's all practical effects uh, the director and writer actually built uh, the werewolf by hand. Wow. Ordered That's hair impressive. and sewed it in by hand. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it's great. The jaw on the wolf actually hinges, so when it's on the actor, it will move with the actor's mm. face. Nice. It's yeah. really incredible. It's beautiful. Um, and like I said, all practical effects, so you know all the guts you see are nothing is CG. It's going to be great. Um, we actually just started the Kickstarter campaign uh, just the other day. We've already got some donations coming in, so it's very exciting. Very exciting. Um, really looking forward to letting the wolf kill me. It's gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's, o it's okay to die just as long as you have a really good death. Oh yes, and yeah, that, that's really what counts. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about your alter ego. My alter ego. Yeah, where you go out to the uh, it's like the kids event. Sometimes. Oh, okay, yeah. the Heroes Alliance. Yeah, yeah. I work with uh, it's a charity costuming group called the Heroes Alliance, and uh, we dress up as superheroes and we visit kids in hospitals. Mm -hmm. We do charity events like the Walk for Wishes and things like that. Um, and we're always in superhero costumes. Mm -hmm. um, I know like uh, the 501st Legion dresses up as stormtroopers and we do the same thing just with comic books. Um, I was interested in getting into it because everybody in the group had DC characters and I like Marvel so I had all Marvel characters and we never ever matched so <laughs> <laughs> I finally got some of them making Marvel characters and I made one DC character to fit in with everybody but it's a lot of fun. I, they had crossovers when, uh, when I was a kid. I remember uh, I had the super size um, Spider-Man versus Superman, yeah. you know, so it, it happened every once in a while. You get it did. Like the, the universe is so neat. <laughs> you know, you were talking about um, going back old school with special effects, mm -hmm. and I, I think, like, the, the best movies a lot of times are a balance of um, both when you have CGI and physical effects, mm -hmm. because I think the mind can't be tricked. You know, when you're watching something that's completely CGI effect, your mind knows that you're watching yeah. something without physical substance. You know, oh, definitely. Um, and you take movies like, um, let's see, Poltergeist, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, Jaws. You know, there, there were no CGI effects, and they still had, and still do today, carry that type of uh, impact. Oh, definitely. Unless you're distracted by a movie like 300, where you have Gerard Butler and Michael Fassbender to <laughs> distract you from all the CGI. <laughs> abs. From all the CGI, <laughs> yeah. the CGI abs, abs, yeah. <laughs> I wish I could do that. Just you know, I don't have to get dressed today or or take a shower. I'll just CGI myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for the computer effect. Yeah, see, I mean, CGI's have been around for a long time. I think uh, the first movie with the CGI effect was when you always hear me say a favorite movie of mine because uh, I have a lot, maybe <laughs> seven, eight hundred. Um, <laughs> but uh, Wrath of Khan, Star Trek Two, Wrath of Khan, mm. when um, the Genesis blows up. Um, at the end, yeah. and, you know, changes the planet to a living planet stuff. That was the first um, CGI effect made by Lucas Films, and the branch of it would eventually become Pixar. Nice. So, uh, God, I, I am come. such a dork. Why don't people shut me up? <laughs> <laughs> Just get me talking about but We're movies. learning so much. No, Brian, <laughs> tell us about your comic book background. Yes. Oh, yeah, I did uh, actually. Yeah, I was drawing comic books when that first novel popped into my head. Mm -hmm. In fact, the... Uh, 
as I said, the dream I had, the first dream was exactly the prologue, except in my dream it was actually a two-page comic book spread with Superman-type lettering on it that was called The Adventures of Jasmine's Husband Sam. <laughs> <laughs> but it was live action, you know, there's a car chase going yeah. on. And, and I thought, well, that is just the coolest thing I've ever seen with my eyes closed. <laughs> and uh, other than that, it's exactly what I dreamed. Do you have um, do you have influences um, in the comic book world? Absolutely, Jack Kirby, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. Uh, all the Silver Age guys, really. Um, but there's also Will Eisner, who I was lucky enough to meet one time, and who liked a comic book we were working on, Al Tudor and I. Um, uh, ja uh, Byrne, John Byrne. John Byrne. Yeah. He was the. He really started making realistic stuff, you know, but. That, there was a, uh, a sort of a handful of artists who started doing that. Um, Angelo Torres and uh, Reed Crandall and a couple of those other guys. Um, as for writing, I just love the idea of continuing story. Yeah. You know, um, with sequential art. Um, it's a great way to tell a story. Well, yeah, when, because um, I, I was a teenager of the 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, like X Men comics, yeah. Represented just not my separation from society and how I felt outside, but kind of opened my view to racism mm -hmm. and, you know, how people perceived each other and everything. I mean, it had a big effect on that. Well, that's when comic mm -hmm. books started becoming three-dimensional. Yeah. There were the, the characters had issues. He wasn't just fighting this alien for one issue, and then next issue he's fighting another alien. Uh, they started having real problems, angst. Because like mean, Chris geez, Peter Parker is just as, as angst ridden as anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, C Chris Claremont and uh, Frank Miller had huge yeah. effects on me yeah. um, back cool. then. And then when he moved to movies and wrote uh, Predator Two, mm -hmm. um, I had I had high hopes that he was going to start doing movies all the time. And now now it's coming around to where it seems like he <laughs> might. You know, with mm -hmm. the Sin Cities and everything. Right. Well, a good story is a good story, whether it's on a page or on film. Yeah. Um, they don't always translate as well as another one might, but if it's a good enough story and if it's done correctly, it should be cool. Mm -hmm. A little bit off topic, but since both you guys have talked about superheroes, if you're going to do a superhero movie that hadn't been done yet, who would it be? <coughs> I don't know. It hadn't been done yet? That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I've always thought Cloak and Dagger. They were uh, characters yeah, from the 80s, yeah. kind of had the whole drug addiction theme to it, hmm. so it was a little darker. I always thought that would make an interesting film. Runaways. Runaways. Joss Whedon's Runaways. Yeah. Because anything Whedon touches <laughs> is gold, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I'm a huge Whedon fan. I'm going to have to call you later. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime when you're dropping the kids off at the uh -huh. pool, it'll hit you. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> phone. Well, thank goodness for cell phones, because you can hold meetings while you're in there. Yeah. You know? True. <laughs> Uh, hold, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back with you. You know, actually, um, Joe Hill's um, Lock and Key would I be, a, I think, an excellent like HBO TV series. I have heard that, heard of that, but I've never read it. It's so good. It's really dark. Yeah. It's very grim, but I actually think it would make an excellent mm. TV series. But on a network like HBO, when they have a lot of freedom to sure adult themes, yeah, yeah. and such, uh -huh. yeah. I write detective stories. I love dark. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, um, I guess uh, thank you for talking with us this segment. We're going to take a little break and then uh, come back and we'll uh, talk about the Howard Hawks classic, Bringing Up Baby. Um, thank you. And uh, please join us back. Or wherever. Where, what? <laughs> that one. That one? That one. Okay. This one. Bye. This one. Are the beans from last night being a problem at work? Uh, who? Who have I got now? Is that cucumber sandwich messing with your fun time?
Then it's time you tried Fart Fresh. Mm. Yes, oh, Jesus. Fart Fresh. Uh -huh. It can turn a faux pas into an oh yes. Hey. Comes in fresh pine, tropical, and cinnamon. And now for those stinky pets. Try Pet Fart Fresh. You won't regret it. Fart fresh, fart fresh, makes farts fresh, it's fart fresh. From Burn Mill. Welcome back, please. Uh, we're still sitting here with uh, Brian and Jocelyn, about to talk about the most incredible film here, Bringing Up Baby, a groundbreaking film from 1938, uh, directed by Howard Hawks, uh, starring uh, Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn. Um, I guess we'll open up the discussion uh, with you, Jocelyn, um, if you would like to just give us uh, a brief overlay of your feelings about this film. It's hysterical. It's still hysterical. Um, the, the comedy that Katherine Hepburn did and that Cary Grant did is timeless. It never stops being funny. The fast dialogue is incredible. There are very few actors today, I think, that can do that kind of just snappy, very fast, mm -hmm. overlaying each other kind of dialogue. Um, Robert Downey Jr. is one of the few, actually, who seems to do that really, really I, I well. Can kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Yes. I can see that in him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's kind of funny you'd mention that. Um, Katherine Hepburn, actually, this was her first comedy. And she had no comic timing. And mm. so Howard Hawks brought in um, various comedians and vaudeville performers daily to help her while she was doing her dialogue to set up her comic timing, mm. uh, which well, you, you would never know. <laughs> worked very well. Yeah, it was, um, he, it was uh, the first screwball comedy. Howard Hawks said it was the first term screwball comedy was used because he called it, after it bombed at the box office remarkably, um, called it uh, a screwball comedy because there was no straight man. There was no straight character in the film. Everybody's kind of nuts up. It's true. <laughs> what do you think of the film, Brian? Um, looking at the writing, <coughs> what sure. I loved was something Howard Hawks did in other movies too. Uh, would have the, the actors talk over each other as we do in real life. You touched on that just mm -hmm. now. Yeah. To the point where in this movie though, it got to the point where I was starting to wonder how much was ad living, how much were they really throwing in of their own? Because there were times when the actor would be turning away and there'd be another line thrown in, which was really effective. Yes. Um, Cary Grant, uh, you know, he start, he reminded me a little bit of his character in uh, Our Sick and Old Lace in this movie. Always befuddled, never quite knowing what's going on, never quite got a handle on anything. Um, but possibly the most normal person in the movie. Yeah. If anybody could be even close to normal, it was him. Um, just uh, surrounded by all this chaos. Um, and I noticed also something about this, and I, I don't know why, but um, every director back then had a stable of actors they used to like to use, mm -hmm. character actors, background actors. Um, and Howard Hawks and John Ford seem to like the same background characters because here, here are Ward Bond it comes in as the state trooper towards the end just to pick up Barry Fitzgerald and throw him into the cell. <laughs> they were together in John Ford's The Quiet Man yeah. very effectively. Um, so it's just beautiful the way they could call on these guys to round out this movie so that every single character, even somebody who's only in it for two minutes, has yeah. an impact yeah. on the on the movie. You know, you had made an interesting you had made an interesting point um, about the dialogue and everything because before 1938, um, talkies were still fairly new. So when people said lines, it would be 
da 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 you said mm -hmm. your line you i say talk. my line right. da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. and yeah and, and bringing up baby um broke that barrier to where people talk realistically where mm -hmm. they interrupt there's uncomfortable pauses you know it's not exact and uh another point because you're talking about carrie grant's character um i had read one of my favorite silent film stars he modeled his character after harold lloyd Oh, really? Even to yeah. the point of wearing the uh, yeah. wearing the glasses yeah. like uh, like Harold Lloyd. Interesting. Nice. I mean, it, do you have a uh, comment you'd like I to do. say? I do. Um, the realism of the banter back and forth, mm -hmm. the conversation, the stepping on someone else's dialogue, I love that. Yeah. And I, I like seeing that in films now, but I still don't think that anyone does it very well. You mm -hmm. mentioned Robert Downey Jr. I think you're right. Yeah, um, the Iron Man movies. I just like, I like the realism of it because no one says, hey, Brian, blah, blah, blah. And then he's going to talk back to me and I'm going to wait. I love their chemistry Although together. often when people talk to me, I do hear blah, blah, blah. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but not now. <laughs> <laughs> their chemistry is good. And Cary Grant, mm. he could charm the pants off of a nun if she wore pants. <laughs> I am just saying him alone that's all you really needed in that film <laughs> he's yeah, impressive I, mean, what an I, re icon, I really, really enjoy all of his performances so yeah. he's very talented was very talented was very talented mm -hmm. he, he i i have a lot of his movies and still don't have half the movies of his mm -hmm. that i want just just a great persona on the screen yeah, you know? yeah. Oh. oh speaking of if uh, anybody out there can uh, give me a copy of mr lucky okay mr. cary grant mr lucky <laughs> from the 40s would greatly appreciate it <laughs> such, a, such a class act, too. One of my favorite stories about, um, about Cary Grant as a person was actually he was having lunch with Michael Caine when Michael Caine was still a you know, mm -hmm. very up-and-coming actor. He mm -hmm. wasn't very well known yet. And somebody walked up to the table and handed Cary Grant the camera and said, Oh, my God, it's Michael Caine. Will you please take a picture of us? <laughs> and Michael Caine is going, Don't you know who this is? Cary Grant. Yeah. <laughs> and Cary just, Yeah, sure. Yeah. Takes yeah. a picture, takes another for safety, hands it back to him. And Michael I love that. Just takes like another nice. for safety. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> it's Cary Grant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it was just after um, Kane had done uh, Zulu, which I was, think it was uh, yeah. big hit. It about about the, that'd that. be about the time Grant did Sherrod. Now there's one that yeah. I have at home, Zulu, and uh, I will watch yeah. as many times as I want. <laughs> love that oh, film. And, and throw the in the monkey wrench of working with animals. Oh, God, oh, for yes. sure. Yeah. Oh, now did you catch where some of the? Th it looked like the t uh, the leopard was not really in the scene a couple well, of times. See, uh, yeah, actually, um, Hepburn had no problem working with the mm -hmm. leopard. So a lot of the scenes you see her with the leopard, she's actually there with it. Cary Grant could not work with the leopard. Okay, he refused <laughs> to, and so they split screen him in. Right. And also, there's a couple places towards the end where the leopard's a puppet. Uh, it's hard to tell. Oh, yeah, yeah I ca that when it's like a headshot one time, I thought that's that's that's, that's not right. Yeah, that's it was a puppet. Right. Yeah. But it there are scenes there's like you just said. There's a joke in here about <laughs> Grant and something else, and I'm just, I'm sitting here just thinking of it, and I got to stop. <laughs> dirty, 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 dirty minds. There I'm were sure there were scenes where this leopard was like <laughs> nuzzling her leg and that yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, it was very obviously <laughs> in there. Yeah. She's just rattling along you yeah know, she, doing her she thing. was fine with it until i guess later on in the production um it actually lunged at her and uh there was worry that if the trainer wasn't there to yeah. grab it and scoop it back what would have happened to miss he miss hepburn but yeah. she was fearless which is kind of funny because Cary grant was just having none of it from the, <laughs> get, from the get go um i yeah, i guess that's the difference between uh, the english and americans you know our, our mm. women have more balls what are you going to do <laughs> <laughs> well, how far can I go with this? <laughs> You're not wearing your kilt, so no right. one. <laughs> and, and another thing um, I found interesting about ba bringing up baby, um, I had never thought about it, but when I was researching the film for the show, I found this out. Um, it was the first time um, the word gay was used in reference, reference to mm -hmm. homosexuals. Really? I was shocked. Uh, yes. I was shocked. Yeah, because it, it had been a word used in the homosexual community since the 20s to describe themselves, you know, um, which I guess it's one of those things that that's our word. You can't use it. Um, but Cary Grant, he improv that line, okay. um, you know, when the, the lady comes in and he's just like, yeah. I just went gay all of a sudden. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that, that was the first time that that had ever and been used And he was wearing lingerie reference. at the time. And he was wearing lingerie at the time. <laughs> Quite well. That man looked really good in lingerie, I have to say. The man could wear I, I know it was black and white, but I kind of pictured it as kind of a frou-frou pink, <laughs> yeah, you know, right, with right. that tassels. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little sparkle to it. That's just me. I think I would accept that on him. Be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am absolutely all I'm right okay. with that. I'm good with this. And you know, there you go. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if anybody else picked up on it, but there is um, no music in the whole movie. You know, that all. was something I was actually thinking about mm -hmm. a lot of movies of the time period. Unless it was a musical or someone was like listening to the radio or sitting in a bar, there was very little music yeah. in you, movies. You had the music at the beginning mm -hmm. for the opening credits. You had the music at the end for the closing credits and nothing in between. Yeah. yeah. Or, or if, they, if they had music, they would have an annoying point in the movies because I noticed this is a trend in the 30s. And it ruins some of my, not really ruins, but takes away from some of my favorite films where you have a comedy going on and then just out of the blue, somebody stands up and sings. And it's because the producers back then were like, if I'm freaking paying all this money for sound, somebody's <laughs> going to be singing. Sing. <laughs> somebody's going to sing now. Um, like Duck Soup, um, mm -hmm. a lot of my favorite, like Marx Brothers films, they just had songs that did not belong that somebody would randomly sing. Yeah. And that's, that's mainly because of like, yeah, we got sound, let's, let's. Well, let's have that chick over there sing. Yeah, that sounds good. I don't care <laughs> what. It's, we just got sound. Come on. <laughs> and I love Lauren Bacall, but I can't remember which. There was one of the bogey films where she sings in the movie, and it's like, oh, no, don't do that. Was really? That, was, that, was, that, was that to have, to have not when she was working at the bar? Yeah. The that's the one. Yeah. That's good the one. movie. Yeah. Good movie. Very good movie. Yeah. But she does this musical number, singing. and it was like, <laughs> yeah. stop it. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, great actress. Good movie, but yeah, some people weren't meant to sing. What, uh, what, what did I see? When they roasted um, Clint Eastwood years ago, they said uh, the most violent movie he ever did was Paint Your Wagon. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the man was not meant to sing. Well, I guess uh, the consensus for all of us is um, go watch Bringing Up Baby. Yeah, you have to see this movie if you haven't seen it. Especially if you want to be a filmmaker, you want to work in the industry, watch the films that matter. I mean, really, people. <laughs> Thank you for being on the show. It's Thank wonderful you so to much have for you guys. Us. I hope um, as you get more projects, or if we have people not show up, that you'll be on again. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Thank you, and uh, please join us as we say uh, goodbye. 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 That's a wrap. All first right. episode. Let's get changed. Wow, another great show today. Thank you so much to Jocelyn and Brian for coming today, and we hope you had a great time. Join us next week when we'll do the whole show in reverse, ending before we even start. You know, that doesn't even make sense. I just love talking about Bringing Up Baby. That is a wonderful film with two of my favorite actors. Grant and Hepburn did have such wonderful chemistry. If you've never seen, you should check it out. Lots of great writing. And speaking of, Lana, just off the cuff, give a line from one of your favorite movies. Beware of the dwarf. <laughs> Same thing. How about you? Wake up. It's time to die. If you watch this and you know what films we are talking about, it post it on our Facebook. We may just mention how cool you are on here. Be sure to check us out on Facebook. <laughs> that is at Facebook.com. Talk films to me. Okay, what do we got here? It looks like this just in, hot off the press. There is a great opportunity for area filmmakers. The 2014 Eichelberg Film Dayton Festival, now in its sixth year, the Film Dayton Festival celebrates the best of film from around the globe and here in our own region. Mm. Short and feature length films are currently being accepted for consideration as part of the festival, which runs from August 22nd to the 24th of 2014. Visit filmdayton.com slash festival for information on how to submit your film. See that? You're nice to us. You get to make a plug. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>